Hi, everybody. Um, so here I have a little talk on ransomware detection. I thought graphs would be a cool way to do it, um, essentially to try and find new in insights to existing data. So let's go straight into it. So just a little bit of background on ransomware. It's not really something new. Um, it originally, I think the first incidents were 2006, so that's almost 20 years. It seems to have been uh, facilitated by cryptocurrency. Um, initially, it was targeted at end users like your grandmother or someone like that. But in the last couple of years, it's become more targeted at enterprises because essentially people making it realized they could quite seriously monetize it. So just if we look at some of the, the ways that it comes in, the top methodology is your phishing attack, some strange email or text message. There's also quite a lot of any web app type systems where they can bypass your security or exploit some vulnerability. Um, and any of you that have got weak passwords, it's probably not the best idea. Another interesting development is the um, ransomware as a service, whereby it's no longer one group that is engaged in the ransomware activity, but you'll have somebody gets into a system and that's their kind of expertise and they'll sell off that access to other actors. So in fact, you don't need any technical expertise. You just kind of put the pieces together and voila. Um, just in terms of some data, um, I think a survey last week that came out estimates $1.2 billion in 2021 um, versus 2020 of $416 million. So that's quite a big increase. The data for 2022 is, I think, a little bit unclear. There seems to be some diversion of resources and I mean, perhaps it's related to cryptocurrencies decline. Perhaps it's um, diverted in Europe. I mean, it, it's just very uncertain. So in particular, I'm going to look at the Conti group, which is one of the top ransomware actors. Um, and they've been estimated their involvement in around 50, uh, 400 cyber attacks. And typically, they're looking at around 25 million, up to 25 million. Um, and what's interesting is, as a business, they were able to generate 100 million a year, which is quite impressive. So, if we take a small case study of an actual incident that happened, so you've got the Irish National Healthcare System. In May last year, basically the entire technology infrastructure was brought down um, and that re revert to appointments getting cancelled, everybody's running with pen and paper, um, doesn't sound like a fun time to have a pandemic. So essentially what was determined is that it wasn't your kind of more traditional malware which would be automated, but essentially it's human operated. And I think this is kind of the next generation that we're dealing with. Um, so it's, it's a different type of uh, approach that's needed. So basically the, the threat was that they were demanding 20 million if it's not paid, and they released 520 patient records to just to prove that they, they had the data. Um, ultimately, they were able to get a free encryptor, which I think they were very lucky. Um, and that's 70% of computers back up and running on the 23rd of June. Information that came out in the last week put the cost of the attack, including cleanup and just rebuilding all your systems at around $100 million, and probably at least 100,000 data records stolen, which is quite, I mean, these numbers that are very round are, but, but I mean, that gives you an order of magnitude. There's some interesting government
reports on the nature and, and source of these attacks. Um, there's just a link there at the bottom you can, you can read more about. So if we look at the typical stages of the attack, um, and I, I think this is quite an important slide because it sets up what the focus of the talk is going to be. Um, so firstly, you're going to have some kind of, let's assume it's a phishing, and what that'll do is it, it's your entry into the network. Then there'll be a whole lot of different types of activity, um, things like your Windows volume, shadow copies, um, disabling various services. You can pretend to be a backup operator. That's kind of a handy way to evade security. Um, terminating Windows services, because if you're encrypting things and you've got Word open, then it's got a lock on the file, so that's not going to work. Um, and interesting, there's some quite innovative encryption implementations. Um, now, the problem with this is typically if you take over the CPU, you're immediately going to notice that your computer is unusable because it's been used for encrypt all your files. Um, but the emphasis seems to be speed over stealth. Um, just in terms of some of the other success, it was the top data le leaker, 207 gigabytes in, in a four-month period, um, various standard hacking techniques, living off the land using your existing utilities, DNS beaconings is a classic way to try and detect I mean, if they're sending traffic out because they've got to communicate back in, that you can pick up the use of things like PS exec. Now, now, what's really vital to understand is your typical ransomware, it's going to be inside your network for about a month. And that's an opportunity where you can try and detect it and respond before you lose all access to your, to your data. Conti seems to be slightly faster. And the data estimates about 15 days. So if we have a look at how exactly the attack will progress. Um, so here we've got a couple of, of stages um, and for the purposes of this talk we're simply going to assume that um, the initial ingress into the network has occurred um, most likely due to a phishing attack. So, I mean, the first thing that, that they're going to want to do is be able to communicate back out to some kind of command and control beacon. Um, in this instance, there was a cobalt strike uh, via run DLL32. Um, once they're inside your network, they want to start to look around, see where your AD is, do some domain discovery, and then they need to get beyond the user that they've compromised and attempt to get some kind of additional privileges. So Cobalt Strike has some things like what they call named pattern impersonation, um, and then ideally be able to move on to the Active Directory. Um, and once on Active Directory, they can copy into various share folders um, and they might propagate throughout the, the rest of the network. Um, so now we've got some extra, extra steps and ultimately right before the end is to start applying group policies which will automatically get rolled out across your network. So, for example, disable your defenses essentially. Um, and in this example, you had approximately a two-day period. Um, so, as you can see, it's, it's, you need to be quite quick if you're going to be able to respond to it. But there's definitely a window of time where you can take some action. So, in terms of some of the typical and traditional approaches that are done, um, they've been developed what they call indica indicators of compromise. So, here is an alert for a specific ransomware that's targeting the healthcare sector. Um, and typically the types of things you can look for is IP addresses that are being communicated with, various DNS systems, domains that have, are known to, to be malicious. Um, what seems a little bit obvious is phishing file names. Um, I mean, if you just can pick up a file name. And this is something that's been 
um, essentially automatically obscured, so it becomes more difficult to to prevent. Um, and and in, in this example, they're primarily EXE files. There's a lot of things like JavaScript uh, images that have got malware embedded, PDFs. That, that there's a whole range of different tactics. And what's kind of interesting is the actual commands. Um, so a lot of PowerShell-based things. So once you enter your Windows network, you can start to do various fancy stuff and move to different places. So essentially, these indicators of compromise are all out there and can be downloaded. Um, but it's, it's a very manual, and it's also you're looking for specific things. So the idea with a graph-based system is if you aren't looking for something specific and you can see anomalies, and, and that's kind of where we're going to be heading. So in terms of the full gambit of different threat actors out there, they've got a, a standardized approach, and the, the Mitra attack framework has attempted to divide this into different sections, and you can use different techniques at different stages. Um, so essentially the idea is to build a knowledge base of all the known hacking techniques, um, and come up with ways that you can essentially detect that they're being used in your environment. Um, so drilling into this a little bit more detail and doing a map against the Conti in particular. Um, so now we can see a small graph of the kind of stages in, in a particular attack um, that's divided into the specific stages of the Mitra framework to the top level. So while you have a phishing, which will be assumed, and that gives you a platform within the environment to launch further attacks. Um, and then we've got various numbered techniques. So for example, if you're in an environment, you can have a scheduled job run, or you can do some specific things, um, bypassing the user access control. Creation of an account is something that, I mean, if, if you don't know what accounts are being created within your environment, this is something you've got to be watching for. Um, T1140 is interesting because you can no longer detect the actual EXE that's coming. <coughs> There's a whole bunch of obfuscation, not just changing the name, but actually changing the binaries by encrypting itself. Um, and ultimately, at this stage, what you're going to have is your security system start to get dis be disabled. Where it gets interesting is, is when you're pivoting through the network and you start to obtain additional credentials, um, there are a, a variety of attacks. I mean, if, if you're present on a computer, you can pretty much see all the other accounts that have been used on that computer, um, and you can see who's connecting to you, where they're connecting from, etc., etc. There's a whole lot of techniques here. But what's really kind of quite concerning is, at the top right, is when you're attempting to gain access onto the Active Directory. Um, so in this specific instance, we've got a, a zero logon, which is around 2020. There was a known one vulnerability within Active Directory. Um, and more recently, there's the Magic Web, Nobilium's essentially a trick to authenticate anyone. That's like doing a Jedi mind trick on Active Directory. And once you're into your Active Directory, you can start to spread those files and distribute the files and we'll start looking at the data around that. So, in terms of the data source that is being used, what's kind of a little bit difficult with security research is to have data that's publicly available that you can use to start to analyze the problem. Um, and there's a open threat research project that has made data available. So that's what's being used as the kind of basis of everything. I've used specifically an example of APT29 that's been used, which is around 200,000 rows. It's primarily generated from 
different Microsoft Windows log files. Um, everything from firewalls to PowerShell. Um, essentially, a vital step in protecting yourself is making sure that you do have these logs available. Some of them need to be enabled um, and try to consolidate them in one place so you can at least look at the data. Um, now, this Mystic Pi is developed by Microsoft, actually. It's the Threat Intelligence Python Security Tools. Um, and just having a quick look at the capabilities, this gives you essentially some really cool examples of actual um, threat indicators. So in this query, you can do a lookup of T1021, and this is a PS exact type technique. Um, and if we look at the types of activity that's being generated by a, this technique, we've got process access, execution of a pipeline, registry access, and these are essentially a count of the number of events within the log file generated by this particular attack. Um, and moving on, if we start to look at an example of Conti executing its uh, package, one of the things it does is by dropping the cobalt strike beacon, it then actually uses the PSExec service to run various things across your network. So this, this is broken into three, three stages, basically. First is getting it put in the admin share. Um, second stage is to attempt to escalate your privileges um, and get system access. And then the last step is then to create a new user. And once you've created a new user, you're able to start to do some different things. Uh, so if we look at the, the simulation network, what it looks like for the data set, essentially you've got four Windows computers um, and you've got an Active Directory server. There are some Azure and various other infrastructure as part of this network, but it's not really the focus of where the data is at. As we drill into it a little bit more, um, getting an idea of the types of data sets, We've got everything from host names, process that's getting executed, where it's coming from, where it's going to. What's interesting is there's some overlap of different data columns, so it doesn't come through in a clean way. You can start to see it a little bit better when we look at specifically process name data. Um, so the generated data has got for example, the username and the domain and the target name. So you might have a subject username and a target username, and then certain log files, it gets labeled as different things. Um, and this is quite relevant later on, as, as we'll get to. I think what's, what's important to note here is the actual event ID, which is essentially Microsoft's recording of what exactly the significance of, of this is. So just to get an idea, if you look in the right-hand column, you can things, see things like a logon was attempted, um, an account was successfully logged on, a token write was adjusted. So this looks like they were given backup privileges. Um, and what's interesting is with backup privileges, you're typically able to do, it, it's like an elevated privilege account, so you can do more in the network. Um, and right at the end, you've got a process was ex so exited. So various things happening. Uh, we're going to drill into that a little bit more. So if we have a quick look at what is graph data, um, the basis, is, the, the core basis is nodes and vertices, or nodes or vertices and edges. And essentially the way they connect it to each other is what you want to look at. And then there's some interesting mathematical properties you can derive from it. What we rely on primarily in this talk is going to be the closeness centrality. So if you've got a node in the middle, how closely connected is it to the other nodes? Um, and the, the mathematics behind it is fairly straightforward. 
However, doing it at scale, you can automate a lot of that using matrices. So in terms of the actual, how do we convert this table of data into a graph? Um, well, I mean, the, the, there's a couple of key steps. Firstly, if you've got a foreign key, that, that, that's an obvious thing that, that instead of being a connection to another table, which is typically a join, you, you can replace that join with a direct pointer. Um, the, the initial approach I, I took was to divide it into the four main sections, and the idea is anyone's going to have an account, that account is going to run on a particular computer, and it's going to do something, i.e. it's going to execute something, and the output of that is going to be an actual event. And that that event is what we're going to look at. Um, what's not included in this is any network or, or cloud-related activity. Um, and I think that, that becomes quite a lot more complex, so it wasn't included in this. Okay, so... Here we start to get what the data is looking like that we're extracting. Um, so using the network X library, we can see if we look at the actual account name and the host name, we have quite a few different hosts. We've got some things in common. And one of the initial challenges you see is an account called network service. And this typically runs on multiple computers. So what this means is, by having a, a duplicate account, you aren't going to be able to identify exactly who is using that account because it could be on any one of the computers. So if we start to make it more targeted and combine the host name with not just... Okay, so in terms of the who that is running the process, the data has three primary fields. One is account name, two is the target username, and you've got the subject username. And depending on the log file, it can be a little bit different, so there needs to be some manipulation. So in the second diagram, you can see by combining the additional data points, you're starting to see a more interesting graph. Um, drilling a little bit further into that, the other side of it is, you actually want to be able to see what the account or the person, well, it's not person, but the specific account on a machine and what is the actual event ID that it's generating. So by starting to look at an account is doing a thing. And what is quite helpful in the data set is not just event IDs, but there's actually categories. So, so for example, you could have a whole bunch of activities Relate, that, that have different event IDs related to a process execution or a pipeline execution. Um, I mean, there's, there's probably about 30 or 40 of these categories in maybe a thousand different event codes. So you're taking the graph and you're getting more detailed, but you're also getting it more granular. So you're able to start to build a picture that is more meaningful. But what what came out of the analysis was there are a whole lot of these event IDs that don't actually have a category assigned to them. Um, and in the middle of this graph, you've got the NAN. So this is just, we don't know what category it is. Um, so it needs some more work. Um, what's important just to point out is that the computer sort of on the right-hand side um, basically three quarters of the way to the top right corner. New York slash system is the Active Directory controller. So we're definitely getting data and activity happening. And you can see this, it's kind of obvious from the first pass of the graph. So once we start to clean up the data and do things like Grouping of suspicious accounts, um, identify unknown users. Uh, there were a bunch of accounts that we weren't able to see who they were, so doing some further processing to make it clear who exactly that was. 
And now here's what we're starting to get as the output. Once we've seen up the categories. So they are very clearly your main graph, which is your normal activity, and there are two separate clusters that is abnormal, abnormal activity. And having exported the actual relation so it can be seen more clearly, you essentially have security group management activity being performed on pretty much every computer or group in the, in the graph. And on the other side, you've also got things being done with Kerberos service ticket operations, which is a bit obscure, but most likely it's something like how they're able to gain unauthorized access. Um, so I think this is probably the most interesting part. Drilling in, I mean, you can now see the top adjacencies. Um, what I think is really interesting is at the bottom, we have WMI activity, and this is exactly what Conti is using, as we showed right up front. It's running via WMI, and these are some of the things that it's being done. And this WMI activity is being run pretty much on every computer in the network. Um, also, on the Active Directory, in New York, you've got a special logon. I mean, I don't like the sound of that. Authorization policy change. This is all looking like something should be looked at. Um, now, getting to put it in more concrete format as opposed to just a diagram, we actually do closeness centrality. Um, and you can see this quite clearly maps with what was shown in the diagram. Um, you got 0 0.01. Those Kerberos service tickets are far away from anything else. Then you got 0 0.06. And the majority of other activity is about 0 0.26. Um, this is just a kind of a snippet of what we're seeing. A little bit of code for how it was done. It's, it's not particularly complex. There's a NX closeness centrality function. I mean, what was more tricky was the joins and mappings and what have you. Um, so just to look at the, the kind of conclusion, we were able to successfully identify using an unsupervised graph suspicious activity. Um, what's noteworthy is there were quite severe data limitations in terms of what we were able to use. It, it is a small network. Um, I, I think what's important to note is that the graph is going to change over time and that, that's not something that we've looked at. So maybe having chunking over the time domain is something that could be of interest. I mean, I, I've also been reading quite a lot about the computational intensity of graphs, which is, is a bit of a challenge. Um, as, as they expand, this was 200,000 events over four computers. So there's quite a lot of data in there. It also needs to be done quite a lot of streamlining and joining together and all that kind of thing. I, I think what's interesting is that Mystic Pi um, is able to isolate individual events. And in this presentation, I didn't go into that level of detail. But I think there's definitely an opportunity to identify those specific nodes, perhaps with a more supervised approach. Where it gets interesting is there's some initial work done on sequence prediction. So when you're doing an, an attack, you've got to go through certain stages. And those sequences are typically driven by playbooks by the rent that the ransomware actors have. So you should be able to do two things. One is predict the next, next thing they're going to do, but also use it as a fingerprint to almost like identify the DNA of who the threat actor is. Um, and the last thing that I think is, is quite important is how would you go about productionizing this? And what you're going to need is some kind of graph database that can do streaming. There's a new database recently released, SurrealDB. I highly recommend you have a look at it. It was one of the top trending uh, new open source projects on GitHub in September. Uh, a lot of promise there. So just, I think, a couple of recommendations. What can you do to protect yourself? 
um, five, e five easy steps. For one, multi-factor authentication. <coughs> Two, some kind of identity analytics. You've got to know where accounts are being created, when permissions, why is that happening. If it's happening on a phone, it's probably something that needs to be looked at. And this brings us to point number three. It's vital to have some kind of process. You can't just have logging. If, if your alarm is going off, what are you doing about it? Number four, patch management. I mean, every day there's another, another vulnerability. What's more difficult is inside your open source libraries, I mean, everybody's using them, but what is inside them? And those vulnerabilities inside of your code is something that's not being looked at enough. Lastly, there's a report that came out in the last couple of days by Microsoft. I've just included a link. I, I, think, I think it's really kind of worthwhile taking a look at. Um, and lastly, that's it. There's my contact email if anyone wants to reach out to me, have a chat. Any questions? Awesome. I think um, there are any questions. Uh, we have one right there. So I think it's easier if you say it and then if you could repeat the question. We only have one mic. So uh, did you consider, thanks for the presentation, very interesting. So did you consider uh, exponential random graph modeling for your time series? Uh, or do you know uh, exponential random graph modeling? I didn't get as far as doing So the question was about exponential random graph random graph models. models. Um, I didn't get as far as working on the time series component yet. Okay, that's a, that's a bit done. Um, I hate to uh, ask something you already explained, but didn't quite get a good sense of what the links were between each of the nodes and the graphs. So the, the, the nodes were, ultimately what we had was an account on a computer and it was generating an event. So, so that was the actual link. But the event, individual events were categorized to reduce the, the, the quantity of them so you can start to see. Um, yeah, so so it was one account was doing an event to another account. And so it, it would be an event that's, or an account that's generating an event. Okay, so the account is the node and generates an event which touches another account. So, so, so the second node is the actual event category. Oh, the, se the, the second node is it. So you have basically accounts and events. Exactly. And the, the links are between. Yeah, so those would basically get added up, ideally with a timestamp on them. Uh, so you mentioned kind of un some, some unsupervised machine learning techniques. Have you thought of any supervised learning techniques that applied to these data sets or graph based supervised learning models? So I, I think the. Say the question. Yeah, just any, have you thought of any supervised machine learning techniques? In, in terms of supervised machine learning techniques, um, I wasn't looking at techniques in particular, but I think the fact that there's a library that can extract the kind of type of event would enable you to automate it across large sets of data. So the supervision would be the ability to automate what is the type of attack that's busy happening. Any other questions? All right. Oh. Hi. I'm here on my mask so you can hear me. So um, thank you for the talk. Very super cool. Um, I noticed that you had to abstract away a number of the layers probably because of data size. So at the event category level and also at the account level. So ideally, I would think that you would want the graph to be ridiculous. All of the computers talking to all the computers, talking to all of the uh, people, talking to all of the events without anything being abstracted. And that's your best chance to catch a zero day, I think, but computation is a problem. So have you thought about that connected of a graph and maybe started chipping away at the bigger problem 
Yeah, and just being able to holistically connect all the things rather than losing information at every abstraction layer. Um, Sorry, I know that's a lot. Okay, so, so the question was, have I thought about expanding it out to essentially be a, a full graph, which is where ultimately it should be to be fully effective? And I would say I, I had two problems with that. I mean, the first was the ability to visualize it. Um, and I think Network X has, it, it's a little bit tricky to get the visualizations to come out nicely. Um, and with, even with this graph, it's starting, you can't see any of the detail. So there are a couple of other tools out there that do a better job of that. Uh, and that was part of the reason. I think the other reason is, I think, as you get deeper into that kind of having a bigger graph with more detail, you're going to need more data for things to come out. Um, and this was using a, a limited set of data. But I think that what, what you're saying is exactly where we need to get to. Uh, and then you also start to need to have a proper graph database that you can use. 